it's a real life thank you so a very good evening to all of you and uh, i on behalf of indian society of cornea and keratoid refractive surgeons welcome you in this uh, webinar on ocular surface disorder and we have with us uh, the president of iskares professor jeevan singh tetyal who is the professor and head of cornea cataract and refractive surgery services at rp center aims new delhi he is a renowned refractive and cornea surgeon with uh, more than 400 publications and various national and international uh, presentations to his credit he is the first indian to perform live surgery in acrs usa and has uh, received the coveted padma shri from the president of india Uh, this is uh, an, uh, a great honor uh, for any indian citizen and he has received multiple awards which includes the achievement awards at the ao and uh, from the asia pacific and uh, various other awards internationally and nationally uh, we will be joined shortly by our vice president iskar dr rishi mohan who is the director of mmi tech and i hospital and he is renowned cornea and, and uh, cataract surgeon and has done a lot of work in dry eye and ocular allergies and has performed various uh, surgeries and live surgeries he has received numerous awards both internationally and nationally we have with us the treasurer of iskaras uh, dr rajiv mukherjee who is the director of mukherjee eye clinic new delhi he is a visiting professor at northwestern university chicago usa and he is a regular faculty at various national and international meetings we have with us uh, a, a very uh, renowned guest and guest speaker dr joseph toba who is the founder and ceo of toba eye center cancers usa he is the president of apex cornea expert society is founder cornea 360 degree 360 conference he is past tenured professor at university of missouri and university of kansas he is co-chairman of treatment and management report of meboman gland disease workshop He is also co-author of Treatment and Management Report of the Contact Lens Discomfort Report. He is also co-author of Treatment and Management Report of the DUS2. He has authored various publications, uh, close to 100, has eight book chapters, and he is teacher of two-hour dry eye expert course for 16 years. He has uh, served as key ophthalmology expert at Investor-focused conference. He, he collaborates in life cycle management for ophthalmic drugs in areas of inflammation and dry eye disease so we welcome dr joseph toba we also have with us dr rohit shetty who is the consultant cornea and refractive surgery and vice chairman of narayan netrale bengaluru he has been practicing high volume refractive surgery for last 14 years and is mentor for the dual academic program phd and clinical fellowship at the narayan netrale eye institute bengaluru uh, and maastricht uh, university he has more than 200 publications to his credit and various textbooks uh, to his name he has various awards to his name to name a few prestigious kanurangachari award the ao distinguished services award and the kasabier award for outstanding contribution to refractive surgery uh, from uh, at isrs in 2019 We also have with us Dr. Virendra Sangwan, who is the Director of Innovations, Dr. Shroff's Charity Eye Hospital, New Delhi. He is the Head of the Innovations and Consultant at Shroff Charity Eye Hospital. He has he is hugely experienced in the field of cornea, uvea, and cataract surgery. Has received numerous awards, and notable among which uh, which are AO Senior Achievement Award, International Uveitis Leadership Award, and Dr. Shanti Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar Award. He is an established leader in limbal stem cell research. He has contributed more than 240 peer-reviewed publications and various chapters and presentations to his credit. He is founder secretary and current vice president of Asia Cornea Society, founder secretary and past president of Uveitis Society of India. He will be shortly joined by the uh, by Professor Namrata Sharma, who is the chairperson, scientific committee of Iskares, and honorary secretary of AIOS and EBI. she is a renowned uh, cornea and refractive uh, surgeon working as professor in the cornea services at rp center aims new delhi she has uh, many awards to her credits and notable among which are the prestigious ao awards achievement awards and she is a principal investigator in many uh, multicentric trials including the uh, the four fda trials She has more than 380 publications in international peer-reviewed journals and has various textbooks 
to her name. And I'm Dr. Rajesh Sinha, working as a professor at RP Center Ames in the Cornea and Refractive Surgery Services. And I'm the secretary of the Indian Society of Cornea and Creative Refractive Surgeons. So I welcome you all on behalf of uh, Iskaris. And before we actually start the presentation, I request our president, Professor Jeevan Singh Titeal, to uh, speak a few words. Uh, uh, thank you, Rajesh. Uh, I think uh, this particular webinar would be a great learning for uh, our members, as well as people who are going to log in today with this uh, session, which is going to be a uh, very, very informative, uh, looking into the, the gamut of speakers we have and the panel discussion, which is going to happen along with this uh, presentation. And topic access is very important for not only for the people who are dealing with cornea, it is important for every general ophthalmologist to understand ocular surface, its implications, the way we are going to uh, manage these cases are, I think, the challenge not only for us, for everybody. So this webinar will definitely give us a lot of thoughts. Let's see how uh, people understand. And I hope people will send questions, queries, which we can answer them. If not in this particular uh, time, we can always take their questions subsequently also through our website. And uh, let's hope we have a great beginning. Okay, Rajesh, we can start. Thank you, sir. So we begin uh, the webinar with the first speaker, Dr. Joseph Toba, and he'll be uh, presenting his talk on detecting dry eyes, the utility of diagnostic tests, old and new. Dr. Joseph Toba, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and good evening to everyone. And thank you for taking valuable time for another webinar. I'm sure you've had uh, many, many over the past months. Uh, I am Joseph Tauber. I'm in clinical practice in Kansas City, Missouri, and I've spent the last 32 years treating and doing clinical research in dry eye and ocular surface disease. And uh, my goal is to make sure everyone learns something tonight they didn't know before. If we speak about diagnosing dry eye, let's begin with thinking about when dry eye can first be detected at all. We're not very well able to identify genetic susceptibility issues or changes in immune surveillance but we can identify changes in specific tear film components. And to a lesser extent, we know how active the immune system is by using testing. Later as dry eye develops, our clinical skills serve to classify patient symptoms and signs into more specific diagnostic categories. Well, is it even possible to diagnose dry eye before patient reports symptoms? I think there's a lot of value in doing so for the reasons shown here. Early diagnosis gives your patients information that they may act on and becoming a clinician expert at early diagnosis will certainly help grow your practice. It's said that doctors are always confident and sometimes correct. And this is often true for doctors who say they know dry eye when they see it. No testing required. Of course, a good history is critical, but these are tests that likely everyone here uses routinely, requiring just basics, only a slit lamp, vital dyes, and a Schirmer strip. And these old tests have served us very well for at least 50 years. I like to approach the treatment of any disease by thinking about the pathophysiology. And in the case of dry eye, we have a lot of mechanisms that have been identified and that are relevant to causing patient problems. They involve each of the layers of the tear film, but other factors, including friction, inflammation, and even how we perceive pain. Well, testing can be tied to each aspect of this pathophysiology, and we're going to review a number of these next. Some may be well known to you, but some may very well be new. And of course, the ones that are available in the US may or may not be available uh, to you in India. Forgive me. Oh. Okay, sorry. Uh, measuring the osmolarity of tears has been possible since the 1980s, but this got a lot easier when we moved from measuring vapor pressure to electrical impedance testing of tears. First developed by Tear Lab, testing now takes only seconds instead of 10 minutes. We all know that symptoms and signs in dry eye correlate poorly. This means that a patient who may have lots of corneal staining 
may have normal Schirmer's testing or even no symptoms. So if we build a composite index of dry eye, adding all of the tests and clinical signs we have, when we compare with any individual test, osmolarity correlates best with this overall index better than any other single test. The threshold of abnormality has been defined as 308 milliosms, as well an inter-eye difference more than eight is considered diagnostic. That means if a patient tests at 298 and 306 between the two eyes, they would still be classified as having dry eye. Testing can be valuable in several ways. It can help you establish a diagnosis or it can help judge if a treatment is working, serving as a metric we can follow. Tear osmolarity correlates well with patient reported symptom improvement after cyclosporin treatment or restasis, also lubricant treatment, not shown on this slide, and even correlates with patient complaints that can be harder to measure, such as distorted or blurred vision, which would quantitate with topographic imaging. So for the reasons here, uh, overall, I give tear osmolarity a thumbs up as a valuable test in your dry eye patients. I think it does allow you to make a more precise diagnosis and it does give you a metric that you can use following disease going forward. Matrix metalloproteinases are tear enzymes that are elevated in many ocular surface diseases, not only dry eye, and are best understood as a nonspecific marker of inflammation. MMP9 levels are up in both MGD, but also Sjogren's, and you really cannot use these to differentiate between the types of dry eye. We do know that the level of tier MMP9 correlates quite well with clinically separated severities of dry eye, as you see in the chart shown at the bottom. But we only have one test uh, that we can use, and that's something called the inflammadry. We do know that MMP9 testing changes with therapy, as you see above, uh, changing with uh, treatment with cyclosporin. However, the way the test is reported is uh, challenging. Uh, I phrase it as this is a binary test. It's positive or negative, and it uses 40 nanograms per ml as the cutoff. So a positive result does allow you to confirm the presence of tissue-based inflammation, but does not allow you to separate mild from severe disease. And this is relatively limiting. So is it of any value? Well, we have many published studies we can look at and we see variability. We see the test is positive anywhere from 40 to 83% of clinically diagnosed dry eye patients, depending on which study we look at. However, it's negative in 97% of non-dry eye patients. So it does have considerable value to exclude the presence of inflammation in patients with ocular surface complaints. So overall, I'm gonna give MMP9 testing a maybe as it is valuable to confirm whether inflammation is there, but I don't find that sensitive enough to reliably diagnose dry eye. A lot of dry eye is related to my bone gland disease as I'm sure everyone here knows. So testing the lipid layer is very, very helpful in your clinics. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to evaluate it and we have very few devices that are really a help. Uh, here is one, LipaView, produced by Johnson & Johnson, looks at interference patterns in color reflecting from the eye surface. We all know when we look at an oil slick on the street, we see colors, and it turns out the amount of color relates to the amount of oil. LipaView reports a metric as the tear lipid layer thickness as a number from zero to 100. And we learn that levels above 90 are considered normal, Levels between 70 and 90 are usually associated with symptoms, and levels below 60 I call the line of misery. It's an interesting test. It also measures how well patients blink, which you see in the second uh, set of arrows there. Uh, in this case, on the right eye, it's as we're facing the patient, eight out of eight blinks were partial, and on the left, only seven out of eight. So this means the patient's lids are not actually meeting when they blink. And that's very important pathophysiologically, although rather difficult to treat. So the phrase uh, dysfunctional tears or dysfunctional blink is something we use as we explain what's going on to our patients. The Keratograph 5 produced by Oculus is a wonderful device, measures many aspects of the eye surface. We have a few of them shown here. 
Uh, on your left is an image that we use to measure tear meniscus height. And on the right, you see tear breakup time. That shows us both where and when the tear film breaks up first. And this testing is done without the use of fluorescein. They call this non-invasive tear breakup time. And some think is the preferred way to measure tear stability since we're not introducing fluorescein dye that can change the tear dynamics. Mybography has become a very commonly used imaging tool for diagnosing MGD, certainly here in the US. And I think the Keratograph 5 is among the very best instruments for this. You see normal on the top. And I explained to my patients that we wanna see piano keys, even and regular white stripes. If you look below, you see mild disease at the left, sometimes even in the absence of symptoms, and it moves towards more severe disease as you move left to right towards the bottom. Grading is still very crude. I personally grade these as mild, moderate, severe, simply according to the degree of gland dropout. And of course, whether this is clogging or actual atrophy and gland loss is something that is still a little uncertain. Well, despite all of these tools, there's still a lot that we need. In particular, being able to precisely assess the functioning of the meibomian glands, not just the anatomy, and measure the thickness of each tear film component would be very valuable. And some of these devices are coming. A dome, an Israeli company, has a device that measures tear film layers in nanometer accuracy and can map out these changes within the blink interval. Uh, this kind of device, because they can measure tear film thickness and also lipid layer thickness, would allow you to separate the types of dry eye, uh, evaporative dry eye from aqueous deficiencies, and could be really a breakthrough device when it becomes widely commercially available. Lacridiag is another instrument that can give images of the meibomian glands, and in fact, three-dimensional images of the glands. That's important because it allows you to calculate a volume, and we hope a volume calculation would correlate with gland function. Overall, I have to say that mybography for me is the single most valuable test as I look at patients with ocular surface complaints, and I encourage you to get any one of the tools that lets you get these images. Some are handheld devices that are re relatively inexpensive, and some are larger boxes for your office that will cost some thousands of dollars. But I think it'll help you educate your patients and will help you understand the disease considerably more. Well, not all dry eye complaints are due to the tear film. So I wanna say just a little bit about Demodex, a parasite quite common on the lid margin and which may be pathogenic in some or some believe many dry eye patients. And this is important as we think about diagnosing patients with complaints and what's actually the problem. At the slit lamp, Demodex can look a lot like other types of lid crusting, but it's taught that cylindrical dandruff or collarettes are pathognomonic of infestation with this particular germ. Diagnosis can be simple. Uh, we just use a slit lamp, uh, sorry, a simple light microscope, pull out lashes and take a look. And if you see the crusts have little feet, the chances are pretty good that it's Demodex. Uh, you don't actually have to pull out lashes to make that, the, oops, sorry, We've got a video that's, uh, you don't, yeah, sorry, my video is not going to work. It is possible to use a jeweler's forceps, grasp the lashes and twirl. And when you start twirling a lash, the Demodex organisms start moving at the base of the lashes and creep up towards the surface. And it's easy to make the diagnosis even without a light microscope. Neuropathic dry eye is a hot topic in all discussions of the difficult dry eye patient now. So I wanna remind you about the rich corneal innervation we have, 7,000 nerves or so per millimeter which is 40 times more than our fingertip. And of course, the cornea has different receptors for hot, cold, mechanical, and chemical stimuli. Pain is a very complex sensation, initiated peripherally, but experienced centrally. So we speak about two different kinds of pain. Nociceptive pain refers to pain caused by the various factors we've already discussed, including epithelial defects or inflammation. In contrast, neuropathic pain refers to nerve dysfunction, 
you might say, inappropriate neural messages of pain, not pain caused by observable stress or injury to the ocular surface. Neuropathic pain is not rare. It's quite common in patients uh, with dry eye, and we see associations with certain other diseases listed on your right, all of which involve a problem in processing a pain within the central nervous system. Diagnosis, at least of the eye disease today, is still relatively crude. Often we'll just instill some topical anesthetic, and if that stops the patient's pain, well, we know it's coming from the eye surface, and if it fails to, we implicate some central processing issue. We use a cochet binet anesthesiometer and sometimes just a cotton swab to detect corneal sensation. But with neuropathic pain, you might encounter exaggerated responses and not reduced sensation because the nerves are, so to speak, hypersensitized. It's important not to confuse words that sound the same. Neuropathic pain is totally different from neurotrophic keratitis. In the future, I think we'll have better challenge tests using hyperosmolar solutions or even confocal microscopy of the corneal nerves and the uh, terminal bulbs to make this diagnosis. Winding down, I'm going to speak a little more about lacretin in my talk on treatments later, but this is an important glycoprotein produced by the lacrimal gland that has many roles in many aspects of ocular surface health. We know dry eye patients and especially Sjogren's patients have deficient levels of tear lacretin, and we know that supplementation can restore a normal surface. I mention it here because there is a diagnostic test in development that will quantitate lacretin levels in tears, and this may be very sensitive and proved to be very useful in how we diagnose dry eye. So to summarize, and I, I know I've touched on a lot of information here, I think testing is useful to all of us, even those doctors who believe they just understand dry eye very well. And as we say, they know it when they see it. As clinicians, we learn to trust our eyes and our instincts, but of course we don't all see the same details when we examine patients. I believe testing is going to improve the level of care that we can deliver. And I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tober, for a very nice overview on uh how to diagnose dry eye cases. Uh, any uh, comment from the panelists? Vidyal, sir. Uh, uh, it was very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, I think uh, uh, definitely we need to have a, a right investigation uh, to be done for these patients. And we have a gamut of uh, investigation uh, invasive, non-invasive uh, investigations. But uh, we know that uh, if you have to look into a patient and quantitate their uh, uh, dry disease, you do require uh, these uh, investigative tools. And one of the important fact uh, at, uh, investigation uh, which uh, uh, Dr. Tobel talked about is tear osmolarity, which is, I think, uh, uh, many uh, people in India don't do it uh, regularly, but it will add into your other investigations uh, and it will be very useful if you are uh, trying to see your patients subsequently after your treatment. To moderate your treatment, this is going to be a very, very uh, useful. Sometimes I do feel uh, it may be a little unpredictable if you don't do a test properly sometimes. You require a little experience of doing uh, this uh, tear osmolality test. Other investigations, uh, many people routinely do it. But if uh, looking into the Indian scenario uh, where many people don't have access to all these things, and there are simple uh, staining with fluorescein will give you so much information uh, in terms of picking up dry eye disease or ocular surface disorders. So I'll suggest people listening to us, uh, any patient coming to you with uh, some sort of a uh, history and symptoms where you feel ocular surface may be uh, implicated just do a fluorescein test. Thank you, sir. It was a message. Uh, any other comment from? Yeah, Joe, how uh, useful uh, this uh, tear osmolarity you find in your clinical day-to-day um, -day life? How, how useful or how effective it is? For me, I would say that tear osmolarity has never helped me make a diagnosis that I had not already made clinically. So there's nothing more useful than a good history. 
it's still very important as a communication tool with patients because patients don't believe everything we tell them and they like to see numbers. They certainly like to see that their number has improved. And some of our treatments don't make immediate impact right after we add them. Certainly most of our anti-inflammatory drugs, be it Restasis or Zydra or even steroids sometimes. The patient isn't better several weeks or a month later, but if you can point to a number that says, look what's <laughs> happened to osmolarity, I find that can be very helpful. Uh, what it doesn't do, and it's really, the, for me, the most important thing in diagnosing dry eye patients is separating uh, lid margin disease as the primary factor from aqueous underproduction. And I think that's where a lot of inadequate care is delivered to dry eye patients. Uh, you can do staining and you can see lots of staining on the corneal surface, add artificial lubricants and the patient is no better because of congestion and inflammatory oils in the meibomian glands and lipid deficiency and over evaporation. So I think as important as it is to take a proper history, it's equally important to really evaluate meibomian glands. And you can do that simply. Uh, the best tool for doing so is very, very inexpensive. And we each have 10 of them. Uh, I use this one. And if you squeeze lids at a slit lamp and look at the quality of what comes out, you're gonna catch most of your patients. It's a little trickier. Uh, I've said to patients, I said, this won't sound very smart, but if I push on your eyelids and nothing comes out, you're either normal or terrible. And I think you need to understand that. We look for some clear oil to come out, but the very severe patients, absolutely nothing comes out. So you have to also pay attention to the induration, the feel of the lid. So I think if you said uh, you only have $1 to make this diagnosis, well, you need to look and you need to press on the lid. And I think that's how I would do it. Joseph, you hit the nail on the head when you said that uh, uh, mebography perhaps is one of the most important tools in armamentorium in diagnosing this evaporative dye is because of the movement gland dysfunction. Uh, not everybody can afford a big machine. I, so what uh, I uh, usually talk about this at many forums and I always say, use your auto refractor, just evert the lid and you can actually make out the meibomian gland uh, anatomy pretty well. So this is one message I think which must go uh, to everybody that just because you have, don't have a high-end system to do mebography, you can at, at least visualize the meibomian glands, their architecture, if there's any blockade, dropout zone, uh, using just a rotor refractor or even the OCT for, for that matter. You can do that on the OCT as well. We can get less expensive and you can see the meibomian gland anatomy even with a trans illuminator. Yes. Just by averting the lid and putting a light behind it. But yes. of course you don't get very good uh, functional information. The first mybographer I ever got was produced in Japan. It was called the Mybo pen, um, Mybum pen. And I think it was under $2,000. And, and I don't believe you can get an auto refractor that inexpensive. So if you want to get to really good, real imaging, uh, that's the least expensive I've seen. The keratograph uh, could be in the, at least in the US in the range of, I'll say 18, $19,000. Uh, but there are many, many instruments, and I think it can be had for less than 10,000. Uh, when I think about all the instruments I have, this one I use every single day. It's really useful for anyone seeing dry eye patients, and there's no, no eye doctor not seeing dry eye patients. So uh, as we are discussing about the MGDs, let's have uh, Dr. Rohit Shetty's presentation on managing MEBUM, addressing MEBUM and gland dysfunction. So, uh, Sunil, can we have Dr. Chetty's presentation? Yeah. Hello, friends, uh, colleagues, chairman. Thank you for uh, allowing me to present this uh, topic on uh, meibomian gland dysfunction in dry eye disease. These are my financial interests. I do receive grants from these companies for working on various research projects. Uh, when you look at the management of uh, meibomian gland, understanding the meibomian gland diseases, uh, the whole uh, talk my, of today is divided into these five parts. The pathophysiology, the imaging, impact of meibomian gland dysfunction in refractive surgery, and most important today is the impact of mask and how do we manage it. Uh, PS2 has laid out a lot of criteria on the management aspects of it, but when you look at 
the two different uh, uh, components of dry eye, the evaporative and uh, aqueous deficient dry eye, everything starts with a lot of changes on your ocular surface. And that in, impacts the tear osmolality, which is a very important function of creating a balance and instability. And when you have this inflammation, it drives in a, a lot of uh, unwanted uh, mediator inflammatory pathways and mediators, which actually creates changes on your ocular surface. What happens in a meibomian gland, the whole uh, concept of nebum, is related to changes, is related to your age-related hormonals, which is your change in your androgens or estrogens, the skin disease, and skin disease on the uh, uh, lid surface. And uh, there are a lot of cicatrizal changes like Steven Johnson's and other uh, uh, changes on your ocular uh, surface, which can also have an impact on the meibomian glands. And, keratin and basically, you know, it's divided into keratinization, cicatrized and non-cicatrized types. And you can say the non-cicatrized have these uh, kind of changes which can create changes on your meibomian glands and also the meibom. So what really happens is when there is a lot of changes happening on the meibomian glands, the secretion of meibom also changes. It's a very uh, complex pathway. There's so many changes which could happen like blockage, obstruction of the meibomian glands. It's like a loop mechanism, you know. You can change the bacterial growths there. That leads to change in your lipid layer. That leads to atrophy. That leads to gland dropouts. And, you know, it's like one cycle which goes on and on and on. And, and we, these are the major keywords of the cycle. How do you study this? Uh, imaging is a very important part of it. And when I say imaging, we start with the, this, uh, the disease index score. There are different uh, ones, Diag index scores, OSDI. OSDI is one of my favorites. And I'm going to stick to that because that helps to understand what is happening to the patient, both in terms of uh, uh, his uh, quality of vision and also in terms of how he feels. Mybography is a very important tool in understanding the gland dropouts. You can have a healthy ones, 20% dropouts. Sometimes you have 50% dropouts and absolutely no glands like in this picture. And there are different grades to identify that. Uh, the, now the Lippy view from j, j now has a very good uh, understanding about how the lipid layer falls on your corneal surface. And every time you blink, you can see that uh, there is a beautiful layer of uh, uh, the lipid layer out there, which shows that the quality of tears is good. And compared to this, when there is absolutely not much of a tear film, the lipid layer, which shows that there is amount of dryness. And uh, lipid layer thickness is called LTT, and that you can correlate from a healthy one, which is beautiful colors. It's like oil on a, on a, on a surface on or water during if it, during the rainy season we see on the road something similar to that and you can see the plant colors are when you have a dry eye tear optics plays a very important role and this is a paper we published and it's on your ocular quality assessment system and you can see that how the tear optics can impact the quality of vision and this is like a point spread function from the from the time the patient blinks to the set the the, the time he blinks again so this is the interval time and this is a time when the tear optics would change. And this is a, how the quality of vision would change along with it. A confocal microscopy and uh, how the meibomian glands impacts the confocal microscopy and the corneal nerves is a very important uh, question. And this has been part of my research question for many years. This, uh, this is from the Heidelberg. You can see a healthy nerves and a healthy meibomian glands are very much necessary because poor meibom, poor meibomian glands impacts the corneal nerves. And you can see that there are nerves are unhealthy. Along with that, there are a lot of dendritic cells and long-standing inflammation, I believe, could even lead to a microneuromas picture. This is a patient of ours with a very bad uh, ocular surface and meibomian gland dysfunction, had a meibomian, uh, had uh, changes in the meibomian gland. Has Also, you can see from here, he had, he had a lot of neuropathic pain. And this is a, this is a Bowman's break from the you know you can see that there's a small break, and he also at the same place has a microneuroma, which probably related to a lot of uh, ocular surface uh, discomfort and neuropathic pain. So many many things are interlinked and related in when you're looking at a meibomian gland disease is not just having just the dropouts of these cells, and uh, we also seen uh, changes in the ocular surface. We also did presentation where changes in your ocular surface. 
myelbomin gland and also changes in the corneal nerves. And uh, we also seen that the poor content, especially with vitamin D deficiencies, and you can see the changes with a lot of dendritic cells and in a compared to in healthy ones. Uh, we look at uh, many tear markers in uh, myelbomin glands that having a poor myelbomin, and there are different ways to analyze the tear functions through a metabolites or the proteins or inflammatory markers, and ultimately you end up in finding a pathway to a disease. And uh, these are the, some of the examples of what we have done uh, during the uh, uh, using the tear film in this myelbomin gland dysfunction, which looks at many inflammatory molecules being increased and these inflammation molecules have a huge impact in your in your uh, quality of life and also how the patient perceives as as a comfort uh, with or without your treatment how does this uh, myelbomin gland dysfunction and myelbomin affect the refractory surgeries you can see two patients one no complaints of dryness and the other one complaining of dryness and the contact lens intolerance and you can see that not much of change in the tear metrics but his ocular surface index is very high. Again, going back to the nerves, because this is what impacts everything, I like to show this. The patient one has a healthy nerve, healthy myelbomin glands. Two, two has uh, also a healthy one. The three also has a healthy one. But you can see that all the epithelium is healthy. The corneal nerves are healthy. These are perfect ones. Let's look at four, five, six. 20 to 20% 20 loss, 20 to 40% loss of myelbomin glands and 60% loss. And you can have the nerves. This is what I said in the beginning. The corneal nerves have a huge direct impact on the state of health of the myelbomin glands in myelbom. So the way the myelbomin glands drop out, they bring in inflammation. And you can see these are all the white cells here, all the dendritic cells. And the ones who have a very poor myelbomin glands also have a poor corneal nerves and a poor and more of dendritic cells and inflammation. So what does it mean? It's just not the cell loss there. It also means there's a lot of changes happening on the corneal nerves. So how does it impact the corneal uh, epithelium? You can see from here when they have a poor uh, corneal nerves and uh, they have a corneal nerves and epithelium have a nice hemostasis. And you can see that the corneal nerves end up in having poor nerves will have a poor ocular surface and poor epithelial uh, surface. You can see the change in here. And you can see that that's exactly what you see on a on the myelbomin glands and this is the second patient uh, you can see that the different types of myelbomin glands have different types of uh, epithelial modeling compared to a normal myelbomin glands and the normal epithelial healing so what we understood from here is healthy nerves healthy epithelium and healthy uh, myelbomin glands means good ocular health it's just not loss of myelbomin gland it changes everything else it changes your uh, ocular surface, it changes your epithelial healing, it changes your corneal nerves. And all that impacts your the type of tear molecules, which makes the patient very uncomfortable. And this is, uh, imagine we do, do the surgery on this patient one, two, three, and four, five, six, the outcome will be completely different. The reason being that one, two, three would end up in a healthy epithelium post-operatively. And look at that four, five, six, who had a poor epithelium, poor confocal microscopy, a poor myelbomin gland, end up in a poor epithelial healing and that would impact the quality of vision post-operatively very severely and this is a classic example of the OCAS which explains the optics of the tear film and you can see that a poor epithelium would impact a poor, uh, poor quality of vision and so what I want to say is it's a, it's a, it's a big trudge of multiple things you know it involves poor nerve healing, epithelial healing, of tear optics, glare and halos uncomfortable quality of life and extremely uncomfortable with the vision and quality of vision. This is all impactful in refractive surgery. Uh, we wanted to study the impact of mask because this is something which has been very close to us. And uh, this is an ongoing study we just completed. What we had done is uh, because of our ongoing research work, we have had uh, the tears of uh, thousands of normal people uh, who was preserved and analyzed in the past. So now that we know that the same set of people are wearing the mask for a year, we went back and took the tears again. So we had the tears of these patients before the COVID and tears now after COVID with the mask. And we wanted to see what changes the ocular surface has. This probably is the only study in the world so far which looking at these two components and we just finished analyzing it and we'll be publishing shortly. What we feel is that is mask induce a lot of exhaled air into the ocular surface. When you have an exhaled air, 
you create a hypercapnia because your carbon dioxide is what you're creating on the ocular mm -hmm. surface. And when you create a carbon dioxide-like system, the molecular pathway is completely changed. And this molecular pathway change is divided into pro and anti nociceptive factors. When you know that these change in the balance of these factors has a huge impact in, as we go on more. So as we increase the duration of mass, as we keep moving towards uh, one more year probably or more years of mass, we will definitely see a lot of changes which will be unexplained. And the symptoms are going to be completely different because the molecular pathway, what is actually happening on the mask related over a year is completely different from a classic dry eye. So what I'm saying is that we'll see a huge change in the way the patient comes in or the outcome of surgeries or even the outcome of uh, TFM. And uh, we would probably be submitting these papers by this month. And uh, it is a completely new dimension into how the mask would change the ocular surface inflammation or ocular surface uh, cellular component. Because it's very important because we might have to relook at a lot of outcomes of a surgery, how the epithelium heals and everything else. And this study is important again because the same set of subjects we use had the tears analyzed in the past for various other uh, normative data, normative work of uh, tears. And we were able to get the same patients again now so that we have the same control. This is That's why this is something to be very interesting. And you can see that many, 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 many things can happen if these factors go on for a longer time. It's just not a dry eye. It's all this new set of molecules, including the nerve growth factors and the, including the change in the interferon alphas, including all these factors, VEGF, which is very important for the nerve changes and VEGF A here. Uh, so this is all important here because this has definitely has an impact in the future. How do we manage? We are known for the warm compress, lubricating drops, doxycycline, antibiotic ointment. We have many, many things. But, uh, you know, we also have the role of uh, osmoprotectin drops, which helps in uh, balancing the osmo, which regulate the osmolality. Role of cyclosporin, reducing the inflammation, works on T cells, reduce the inflammation, inflammatory cytokines, and helps in remodeling or helping in uh, changes on the myobomin gland. Then I use this regularly, and I think it's one of the most important uh, role is also to regulate the change of healing of epithelium as well as the corneal nerves. It's just not the myobomin glands which you're worried about. As I showed in the previous picture, it's a mix of myobomin glands, epithelium, and the corneal nerves. Doxycycline has a huge impact uh, in treatment, uh, helps in the breaking secretion of bacterial lipase, anticollagenous property. MMP9 is a major factor here and improve the lipid profile of the mebum gland secretions. Anti-inflammatory is one which we all know. That's how why it works on MMPs. And uh, people also are talking about low dose. Along with sometimes when people don't tolerate of GI upsets, I usually use azithromycin three times a day. And I do it for three months, every month, uh, three times a day and for three months. That also works equally well. And these are some papers which talks about the myobomin gland dysfunction. Um, there are a lot of newer modalities like LIPI4, EI, and ILIT. And lippy flow work on a work work that thermal pulsation. You can place the uh, the applicators inside the eye. What it does is it and this this actually covers the cornea so that you don't really have a damage on the cornea. And this applicator helps to kind of milk this glands after giving heat for at least twelve minutes. And heat is up to around forty two minutes. Forty two degrees is quite safe. Uh, IPL work on uh, photochromatic lights. It also uh, gives you uh, a you know, this kind of uh, red light, which helps in uh, photomodulation. Photomodulation also helps in uh, a lot of changes of your myobomin glands, especially works very well when there's a lot of vascular changes on the lids and when there is a lot of uh, inflammation. EI is one more new drug. It works on the zygomatic nerves. This is what they say, so that the branches of those nerves helps in uh, making the... Uh, the, the myobomin gland to simulate more and secrete out the tears. And these are all more of theoretical ways of it works. And Lipiflow has known to reduce the tear molecular factors. We have done the uh, analysis of tears before and after. And these are all the few data which shows that there was improvement in the overall 
visual quality and also the ocular surface disease index uh, after using the uh, EI and all the all the three things and we can see that most of them have 90 to 94%, 95% of effectiveness, which is quite good. And this is a paper which shows, talks about uh, lippy flow up to nine months of effectiveness, which it shows. So what are the, uh, how do I summarize this? Uh, there's a lot of changes happening. Newer diagnostic tools really help in changing the way we look at uh, uh, um, treating the mybumin gland dysfunction. COVID uh, and basically the mask has a completely new uh, dimension of how it works on the ocular surface. And I believe that the pathway of how it works on the ocular surface is not, I repeat, is not the same as a dry eye pathway. And this is a very important finding. I'm sure once it gets published, we'll have the full data to be shared because this pathway is not the same type what you see in dry eye. So the patient may not complain of dry eye at all, but they may have a lot of changes happening which mimics dry eye as far as the damage is concerned, but they may not have symptoms because there's a huge imbalance of uh, how what a nociception and pro nociception factors are. Uh, managing ocular surface, especially myboman gland dysfunction, has a huge impact in optimal wound healing. And uh, there are a lot of new things like lippy flow, uh, even in pre cataract surgeries or, or lippy flow EI or I like all of this, what we have has a huge role in pre and post uh, cataract surgery. I have, a, I do it lot for a lot of my patients who have an issue on the pre-op uh, status. Uh, when I see a lot of my women gland changes and I use it in them uh, frequently. Uh, use of uh, drugs like uh, doxycycline or azithromycin or use of uh, osmoprotectin drops, especially in today's time, is very crucial. And uh, cyclosporin, I think is, the role of it is becoming more and more stronger in post uh, cataract and refractive surgery because of the changes what we are seeing and also the changes of uh, mask induced changes, which can impact a lot of healing, uh, wound healing changes. I thank my entire team, research team for compiling this, uh, all these research projects into a translation science. Thank you. Uh I thank Dr. Rohit for uh, this wonderful presentation. And since he's traveling, so he may join in the end for discussion. So I would just like to have a quick comment from Dr. Namta Sharma, and then we can move on to Dr. Sangwan uh, for his talk. Dr. Namta, this yeah, I, yeah, of I, MGD, I, which is, I mean, we keep uh, we uh, keep trying to you know know more about it, but uh, again, something else comes up, and I guess it's. Uh, very recalcitrant kind of a condition. I think uh, it was a very nice talk and it was an insight into what is going to be the future of uh, dry eye. And I think Rohit very rightly said that ocular surface disease is a completely different entity. It is so many variables. It has so many presentations, myriad of pre presentations. And I think probably, although it, it looks like akin to dry eye, uh, whatever he was uh, discussing about, uh, because uh, Dr. Sangwan is also here and we all know as ocular surface specialists that what we deal with is a much severe form of uh, ocular surface disease. And this is just one end of the spectrum, whole end, uh, which is shunted whole end or subset of patients who are shunted from, you know, cornea specialist to cornea specialists. Uh, because uh, some of them are cases of end stage diseases, which really nobody wants to tackle. So it is good to know what is happening and seemingly normalize. By that, I mean seemingly where anatomically everything appears to be normal. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis what is going to happen in severely diseased eyes. I'm sure Dr. Sangwan is going to throw a light on such cases. Uh, thank you, Dr. Namrata. Uh, we will have the opinion of Dr. Sangwan. He is going to be the next presenter. He is presenting on decision making in ocular surface disorder. So I request Dr. Sangwan to you know, begin his presentation on this topic. Thank you, Rajesh. And uh, I'll just share my screen. And uh, yes, uh, that's very true that uh, the diseases that we each manage may be very different. The uh, kind of uh, spectrum that we each manage may be very different for each of us. And uh, my talk would be more towards surgical aspects and clinical decision making 
but at the same time highlight the key points uh, how we choose certain things in management of ocular surface disease in general so this is a 55 year old lady with rheumatoid arthritis over 10 years own hcq and methotrexate see complaints of ocular irritation light sensitivity and rough feeling in both the eyes her uh, vision is 618 uncorrected and surmer values and surface staining is positive surmers are low but her main problem, her main concern is, will she go blind due to this condition? You know, managing her uh, surface and the underlying immune mediated is one aspect, but men, uh, uh, sort of helping her psychologically and keep giving her psychological support is very, very critical, which we doctors may not have, uh, you know, we are not, may, we may not be very good at so we should think of incorporating a clinical psychologist in our practices especially for patients who have uh, chronic conditions which we know are not curable but they can be managed their quality of life patient's quality of life can be improved this is a 12 year old boy with the history of itching for last five years and this is a kind of uh, condition that uh, we see quite often on uh, in our patient in, in the pediatric age group, uh, severe itching, redness, and you can see massive pigmentation on the ocular surface. <clears throat> Here, dryness is not the major, cry, ma major concern. I think the major concern is how to rescue the limbal stem cells. And topical treatment, mast cell stabilizer are not going to be helpful. So here, main uh, treatment would be systemic immunomodulation. And I would not hesitate giving a short course of systemic steroids along with uh, cyclosporin as a first choice systemic and uh, rescue these uh, the, the surface from uh, further deterioration. A 15 year old boy had a history of uh, bone marrow transplant five years back. Um, typical symptoms of GVHD and uh, his vision is poor. His uh, surface is dry and uh, the summer values are quite low. Again, here, uh, the management of the disease, collaborating with the bone marrow transplant surgeon, using perhaps the pros lens would be very helpful in addition to all other things that, that we talk. And we manage uh, as a tier substitute and different kind of things, uh, modulating his systemic uh, immunomodulation in collaboration with the physician would be very helpful. Sometimes we get stuck that the, the patient has been to many physicians and he has been labeled with a severe dry eye. And I want, through this video, I want to illustrate an important point. Hi, I am uh, Mayank and uh, I am from uh, Ranchi. I had uh, a specific problem in my eye. My day-to-day -day activities uh, were getting uh, uh, disturbed. For coming here, I visited uh, Chennai, Bangalore, uh, Kolkata, Delhi, Mumbai, uh, and a couple more places, uh, uh, all of them being uh, topmost eye uh, hospitals all over India. But they all did my procedure and uh, uh, they all went through certain uh, checks and uh, there, no one could actually find a solution to it. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ashok Agarwal uh, then referred uh, me to LV Prasad Eye Institute. Uh, I came here in November 2016. My experience has been uh, just uh, life-changing and it's been uh, very good. Mayank had an eye problem which was diagnosed as dry eye at many places for last 10 years. So here he came with a referral that the boy is feeling depressed and because he's, he's not able to see light and all that. So when I examined him, I did not find that he has a dry eye or in fact, he has any eye problem. And it was very difficult for him and the parents to understand that this is not an eye problem what we are dealing with. And then we started talking about what is that we are dealing with. Then I gave them different suggestions that maybe we should look at, uh, you know, consulting a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And it turns out that, uh, he had consulted a very good psychiatrist and uh, he was on a medical treatment, which is making a tremendous difference. Very happy with his current treatment and I wish him all the best. I was worried about this for the past 10 years of, of my life and mm. 
uh, had I not been here, I don't know like uh, how would my uh, future be. I'm so lucky to uh, have you as my mentor, sir. So this boy, uh, you know, all of us have these uh, uh, mental uh, sort of uh, biases. So he had uh, something called anchoring uh, bias that uh, everybody he saw uh, just look at the previous physician's diagnosis that his patient has a dry eye. He's very young, 18, 19 year old boy. And I asked the question, why should he have a dry eye? There's no underlying disease. And that's where uh, his diagnosis of uh, depression uh, came into being. And after, when I met him after one month, uh, he was very, very happy. So we need to step back and uh, pay attention. So normal ocular surface has three elements, preocular tear film, surface epithelium, ocular surface sensitivity. All of them need uh, in equilibrium and optimal functioning if we want to achieve good vision. And uh, the conjectiva, the tear film, they are interdependent. The immune response, the uh, conjectiva associated immune response is so critical for its normal functioning, like what we are talking about the ocular uh, innervation or the surface innervation. Uh, it's very important for the epithelia, the secreting element, the immune system to function all in harmony. And these are different uh, compos compositional hydrodynamic factors, which also uh, uh, come into being. All this uh, sort of uh, is coordinated at the brainstem level um, because the stable tear film is essential for healthy ocular surface. Healthy ocular surface is dependent on the tear film. So both are important to each other. Then making a dis difference between, uh, you know, on examination, whether you want that patient is suffering from blepharitis or mebomitis. And the talk and on mebomitis was very nicely covered by uh, Rohit Sethi. Similarly, you may have very small, subtle uh, defect in the lid margin, which will, uh, you know, interfere with the spreading of the tear film. You may have conjunctival places, you may have delen. So variety of other things that you may see on the ocular surface, or you may have atonia or the apposition of the lacrimal punctum is not uh, appropriate on the globe. Then with, if, if the patient is complaining of dry eyes, you should think of whether this is impacting the surface or not. And that you can do by uh, surface or vital staining, uh, both uh, rose bengal and the uh, fluorescent staining. Uh, the diagnostic test and everything is covered by Joe and uh, I think now we have excellent uh, tools to make the diagnosis. The range of uh, diseases, in addition to dry eye disease, there are a variety of other conditions which affect the uh, ocular surface. And here are some of the videos uh, which include immune mediated disease, the lid margin problems, or the injuries like the cement or the um, chuna on the ocular surface in the cornea, which you are seeing in the left lower corner. Uh, which was retained for more than a month, and it keeps migrating inside the uh, cornea. If you don't remove this, I will go into uh, complete hiasis or it will be dysfunctional. Similarly, in the chronic phase, you may have uh, Moran's ulcer, which has eaten away the limbus and central island is remaining, or a chemical burn with total limbal stem cell deficiency. At, after you know complete uh, burnout, uh, Moran's ulcer may present like a chemical burn with the surface penis. So it's very important to discern underlying condition with which you are dealing before taking a surgical decision. The allergies uh, are very common in our part of the world. And uh, they are sometimes in about 10 to 15% of patients, they're very severe and they persist in the adulthood. This is uh, the impact or the, you can see the uh, range of presentation, both palpable and the limbal form. The surface staining with the fluorescent shows you the extent of uh, poor ocular surface. And here, just treating with the dry eye or replacement uh, therapy with the tear substitute is not sufficient. Uh, in some of these patients, you may need surgical intervention. Bef and before that, you may need a medical uh, treatment. And these are some of the factors that may contribute to the um, surface damage in, in patients with the severe allergies. 
the management uh, in addition to being topical uh, i think you need a, a systemic treatment and a surgical treatment in selected patients which you are seeing here a supratarsal steroid injection for the uh, patient with tarsal form of uh, vkc palpable form of vkc and uh, a amniotic membrane transplantation for the uh, sealed ulcer the indications for systemic steroid for me in these patients would be moderate to severe vkc persistent symptoms thick mucus discharge numerous inflammatory infiltrates and giant papillae uh, which respond which responds to topical steroids but you need uh, frequently these drops so in those cases i will start systemic steroids along with the immunomodulator then the question is whether you're dealing with a medical or a surgical condition obviously in the left side uh, of the videos both you seen earlier and they are purely medical condition and the left side is the oss and which need a surgical treatment so making that distinction is very important and it's for this these are two uh, you know dramatic spectrum end of the spectrum but there can be sometimes very subtle differences when you choose a surgical decision you should think ask the question whether the surface is wet or bone dry if it's bone dry anesthetic and or anesthetic you should not do any surgery unless there is an emergency like a hole in the eye if it is a wet surface then there are variety of options which can be uh, used and some of them are listed here like amniotic membrane transplantation some form of limbal transplantation and uh, we will cover uh, those surgical aspects in the rest of the talk so suturing the amniotic membrane for a variety of ocular surface disorders uh, is shown here uh, you have to use uh, you should use uh, you know perilimbal circumferential sutures mostly i use tenofovir and uh, these can be um, uh, if you are not using or if the glue fibrin glue is not available uh, you will see here i am suturing uh, circumferential just on the limbus inside the limbus without uh damaging the blood vessels or which are without causing the bleeding and then you uh can bury the knots and that you know you can put four to six circumferential sutures you can also think of putting is one per string suture but i really don't like because it uh you may not be able to tighten it very well if you have to use the fiber if you have access to fibrin glue the use of fibrin glue is made the life of the ocular surface surgeons much better much easier um because uh, the surgical time is reduced the inflammation is reduced significantly in the post operative period and uh, it's very helpful if you have access and if you can use and uh, also the fibrin glue is not really disposable that you can use the one while that comes it can be used for multiple patients so this is you don't need to premix uh, the two components you can mix them on the surface like what you are seeing here i am putting the first component that is the thrombin a uh, fibrinogen first the thick part and then the second part was the uh, thrombin and then you spread the membrane iron it out and then you can uh, shoot, you can cut the excess membrane trim it and that's the end of the surgery you may or may not want to use the bcl i like to use the bcl another important uh, step i think in the surgery is the removal of the chuna chuna retained chuna is very common and that i see as in referred patients so unless you remove this uh, chuna the the patient's condition will not be uh, salvaged and this will lead to very devastating uh, situation if you see um, some surgeon have done the amniotic membrane graft without removing the penis so we should remove the penis you should remove the um, loose epithelium because it accomplishes two things one it removes the dead and necrotic tissue secondly it stimulates healing and then you put the amniotic membrane because it will stick better and it will do the job better like what you see here me doing the um, removal of the dead and necrotic tissue then putting the membrane and use the fibrin glue or suture whichever uh, you have access to the uh, this was another chuna injury patient uh, where the chuna was really deep and epithelized so i had to remove and do a partial keratectomy to remove the uh, chuna or the lime paste 
and then put the amniotic membrane and see here i have done the 360 degree uh, peritomy because if you do this you are able to do a better uh, dissection and your uh, your membrane will stick much better as compared to if you remove only the um, tissue in that area or half of the cornea so don't hesitate if you have to do please do a peritomy test that will help in anchoring the amniotic membrane far better on the ocular surface and then the fibrin glue and the amniotic membrane the limbal transplant this is the first video of uh, kent canyon and safer saying that i could find of how you take the limbal biopsy if you observe the biopsies they start used to start uh, dissecting from the corneal side and then come back while i started uh, on the completely opposite side and my thinking was that uh, if you start from the conjunctival side your anatomical planes are very well defined you know how deep you have to go what planes you have to follow so therefore i have been practicing for last 20 years the way biopsy i have shown whether i am doing for conjunctival limbal autograft whether slat or flat or any uh, where i need limbal uh, as a tissue i would harvest in that manner these are the outcomes of uh, you know the landmark paper in 1989 where the, for the first time they showed that if you put these segments of the limbus uh, the surface heals but the, there are some papers which talk about donor eye complication if you take the um, limbal more than three, more than 6 clock hours or 6 clock hours uh, so these are uh, complications stimulated for us to uh, do further and come up with techniques like uh, uh, clat and slat, which I'll talk later. The other question people ask is whether you should do a cadaveric or a live-related uh, limbal transplantation. My preference is uh, live-related because if you're doing allograft, the, give the patient the best, stand, the best chance to survive. And since you are going to use intense immunosuppression, which is costly and potentially toxic. So my choice is to use um, live-related. This is just a patient who I had operated in 2000 and did well on cadaveric limbal transplantation. The live related, again, the amount of biopsy that you take is too much. Therefore, I had stopped practicing this way back in uh, 2002, 2003. After initial 15, 20 cases, I never practiced this uh, since uh, the flat and slat has made the things much better. Should you do direct or cultivated? Uh, now this question is really not relevant because uh, the uh, cultivated is not a and uh, also is not a good option i would even i will now do for last 10 years only slat simple limbal epithelial transplantation and this is just for historical reasons that okay cultivation had some benefits but also it had uh, some downsides downsides were the requirement of a you know clinical grade stem cell facility two surgical procedure and the uh, surgery being very expensive then uh, we started practicing slat, which I will surgical part I'll skip. And this is the kind of results you can expect. And slat has uh, now scored all on these seven parameters, either equal or better than clow or clat in every aspect. And most important, the surgically and patient acceptability wise, this is the most effective technique because it's one tenth the cost of uh, clat and uh, patient doesn't have to come twice. You don't need a lab. You just need a uh, surgical uh, OT and the uh, patient and yourself. So in summary, uh, in ocular surface diseases, focus on the clinical signs and their impact on the surface, elucidate underlying conditions, customize treatment as per clinical situation in a given patient. Surgical or medical uh, treatment is an important decision that you should make. Treatment of underlying immune mediated diseases uh, important. If you are not familiar, you should collaborate with a rheumatologist or a hematologist or someone who knows these medicines. And uh, you know, limbal transplants uh, like SLAT, AMG, Prose Lens, Fibrin Glue, they are excellent tools in surgical management for these patients. Medical management and diagnostics for the dry eye and ocular surface has improved tremendously in the last 10 years. And I think we are in, in a very good space for these patients. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Very nicely pointed out in the end that, you know, in cases of immune-mediated ocular surface disorders, we do require, uh, you know, a multi-departmental approach and uh, we have to, you know, seek help from our 
colleagues from immunology, rheumatology, etc. Uh, any comment from the panelists? Dr. Rishi? Well, I thought it was a wonderful presentation as always. Uh, Virendra always comes up with uh, gems and I think he's right. SLET has pretty much overtaken all the techniques that are there and he's beautifully demonstrated how uh, and emphasized the importance of removing all the, uh, uh, the chemical, especially the tuna that may have got impregnated in the tissue and to look for it underneath the lids. I think overall, uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. Thanks. So, shall we move on to the next, sir? Vidyal, sir? Any? Yeah, I think uh, what the uh, entire gamut of uh, ocular surface disease we have seen right from the first presentations, this was uh, one of the uh, no, wonderful presentation from Virinder. I do understand, you know, especially the country we have, uh, apart from the chemical injury like tuna packet injury, which is so prevalent. Similarly, the allergies he has sold, you know, all these ocular surface disease will get compounded by these chronic allergic disorders. Now, ultimately, they're going to have this type of a chronic uh, psychiatric type of uh, damage. Then you do require a stem cell uh, enhancement or uh, improving the ocular surface. So Virinder has a huge experience in this and we have all learned from his experience and his publications, which really help us to understand uh, making a proper algorithm of our patients suffering from ocular surface disease is, you know, a uh, way of uh, thinking and they have given us a right direction. So I do think uh, we all understand now how to approach these patients and uh, how to uh, give them a safe area for uh, no further management. A wrong step in the management of ocular surface disease can create further damage. So that is what we have to learn and put it to a right uh, perspective in terms of diagnosis that referring patient to a proper place is very, very important nowadays. And rather than trying to play with the person's ocular surface. We welcome Dr. Rohit, Rohit Shetty, who has joined. He is traveling, but he has been. It is really nice of him to join, and uh, we could uh, listen to your presentation, Dr. Rohit. It was a wonderful presentation on uh, MGD, and the wonderful paper that you are, you know, uh, process yeah, on, uh, you know, COVID-related impact on uh, ocular surface disorder. Uh, we would like to have your, uh, you know, direct comment from you, and not the recorded one. Thank you, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Loud and sorry, clear. Uh, sorry I, 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 I'm traveling, so my connection may not be that great. Uh, what happened was uh, uh, we had uh, we wanted to see how the ocular surface immunology is going to be changing with uh, the, with the mask. So we had collected a lot of. Uh, ocular surface parameters for a different study for a normal healthy hospital volunteers. And it so happened that we had taken all the parameters, including the uh, biomarkers just before COVID. And after the COVID happened, the mask impact, the same set of people, uh, we had a very, very streamlined uh, uh, you know, data of how many hours they were using the mask. And when we found that there is a huge variation in the way and it followed a perfect trend to what is going to happen to the ocular surface. We would see a lot of them had epithelial, uh, healthy people, non-contact lens wearers. And a lot of them had uh, huge changes on the epithelial maps itself. A uh, lot of changes had the confocal microscopy. And what is interesting here is that uh, we created a, a small model where we put uh, corneal epithelial cells and used carbon dioxide because the carbon dioxide is the ones which you are breathing out on your ocular surface. And what was interesting is the same experiment gives the same results what we're seeing in a patient's, or sorry, in a, in a healthy volunteer's eyes. Why is it important is, uh, this is something Rajesh sir, uh, it's going to be very, very important for all of us as clinicians is, the markers, what is happening is not clinically making the patient go for those pain or dryness or those types. They are all, I would say, uh, white inflammation markers. 
they're changing a lot, but it's not creating the patient to have an effect. So you don't see that uh, huge impact like uh, high OSDIs and all that. So I feel that these kind of uh, changes would have an impact on wound healing over time. So it is important that, and this is, the, to sum up, what it is causing is not hyperosmolality. Carbon dioxide is causing hypoosmolality, which we don't see in a traditional dry eye. And what happens is hypo is also not good. Hyper is also not good. So I saw, you know, you are more in the isosmolar level. So this is the first time we are actually seeing the ocular surface going into a hypo hypoosmolar state. So we need to find uh, what drugs or what medicines could help them to reach a different state. If this COVID mask business continues for long, and uh, most of them were doctors also because they were healthy. I saw healthy people whose uh, samples were taken. So I feel ocular surface disease per se and uh, will have a huge change over time when we start looking at mask as one of the factors and the tighter the mask is worse because more carbon dioxide is pumped onto your ocular surface. So this is my take home from this uh, work which we are going to submit in this week, this month. This is a wonderful study, um, a great thinking actually about how uh, you know use of mask can you know have an impact on ocular surface and the and the uh, the concept of having hypoosmolarity you know obviously isoosmolarity is something which is uh, required and most of the times we keep talking about hyperosmolarity but hypoosmolarity being caused by all this and I mean having an impact on ocular surface that is something which is really a wonderful thinking and a, a very good study. So what happens is, uh, I want to add one point here, if you permit. Yeah. We are all used to treating hyperosmolar state. Yeah. Uh, Sangwan sir and the other colleagues would agree that we are not used to knowing what to do with the hypoosmolar now. Yeah. And uh, to create this experiment, we use the cell lines and pumped in oxygen, uh, sorry, carbon dioxide, which is exactly the amount which we, when we breathe out. And uh, we saw that uh, the same kind of a feature is happening. The cells are actually, cells die when you have a hyperosmolar state also. Uh, something similar to what you see in a hyperosmolar state. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, if possible, you keep logged in and we will have more discussions uh, in the end. So we are now moving on to the last talk of the session and we have Dr. Joseph Tauber will be talking on the newer advances in dry eye treatment. So let's have Dr. Tober on newer advances. Thank you. And it's uh, challenging to have to follow so many good lectures and uh, stay to this high standard. So I'll, uh, I'll do the best I can. Um, we're gonna turn now to the treatment of dry eye and hopefully I can help you turn deserts uh, into gardens. I'm not advancing yet. There we go. All right. Let's uh, let's start talking by where we yeah, are. Can you go today. to the slideshow mode? Oh, am I not there? Forgive no. me. No. Yeah, it's fine. Sorry about that. Let's start with uh, where we are today. I think we all know dry eye is not a, a national specific problem. This is global. And I think we all recognize that many patients go untreated. The gap between diagnosis and treatment seems to be even greater in India, where we find that identified dry eye patients are over 12% of the world's pool of dry eye patients, but only 2% of those treated. India is not alone in this, but you can see that many patients, wherever we look, remain without treatment. So why is that? Well, we know dry eye is hard to treat. We've talked about this a lot this evening because of the many different factors that are driving this. They're confusing, they're multifactorial, they may even conflict trying to treat one may make the other worse. Uh, but we still a lot that we have learned and I think we can upgrade our treatment. So uh, let's dig in a little bit. Uh, let me start with what is current standard of care. And there's a lot of ways to define exactly what that means. Uh, there's for me, there's some treatments that I consider treating background factors, 
and I referred to omega-3 or fish oil supplementation. We have other treatments that are addressing the underproduction of tears, shown there in yellow, and some that are aimed more specifically at treating evaporative dry eye. Uh, towards the bottom below the dotted line, I show some of our treatments are not so easy to classify. They really address both mechanisms of dry eye uh, and so are a little bit more broad in that sense. Let's start with basics. Uh, at least in the United States, we have literally hundreds of choices of artificial tears uh, and great confusion as far as which is best. Uh, I'm not sure in this case, many choices is any better. We have thin, we have thick, we have oil containing drops, we do have hypoosmolar, uh, we have all kinds of things. We also have four approved prescription eye drops for dry eye, including two different cyclosporin preparations, that's Restasis and Sequa. We have Lefitograst, and most recently we have a topical steroid, a modified lodopredinol called Isuvis. Here's my personal approach to treating dry eye. It's not exactly how I explain it to patients, but how I think about it. Uh, I do think it's important to divide into tear underproduction and lid related dry eye, but certainly would highlight that very few patients have only one and not the other. Uh, overlap is the rule. I'm not gonna go through this in detail. I'm not gonna touch on the treatment of uh, MGD in any way. I just wanna highlight what we do with uh, the basics of dry eye after supplementing tears, trying to stimulate tears, considering punctal occlusion, that's what I mean by retention. When you still have patients who are uncontrolled, we may find that higher dose restasis is helpful. I use a fair amount of serum tears. Secretagogues are really uh, not uh, easily available. So a lot of my patients move on to clinical studies, looking at new treatments that are still in development. And I consider it a really important part of my practice that I can offer uh, these new studies and, and see what's going to work. I think I've mentioned before, I try to approach all treatment uh, addressing pathophysiology, and I consider each aspect of the ocular surface disease. Treatments can be very specific, targeting a, one single tier component. They may be targeting inflammation. They may be treating the neuropathy, and it's different for every patient. But even with this really splitting of treatments, we're not solving it for all of our patients. We still have a great desire for new treatments. This is one of my older slides, goes back to 2019, and I show it just to make one point. Uh, from this long list of drugs that were in development, only two of them have come to a conclusion. Uh, approval in the case of the Cala steroid, that's Isuvis, uh, and rejection for Topovert. My point is that all of these remain under study Research takes a very long time to bring drugs to market. I believe the average is about 17 years. So I hope the things that I'm going to mention next uh, won't require another 17 years before they become available. There are some treatments that are not quite research, but I'll say growing in popularity in the United States for the way we address dry eye. No question, there's great emphasis on treating MGD. And that focuses a lot on various thermal pulsation devices. Uh, not mentioned earlier, I'm going to bring it up in uh, discussion later at the end, is my Bowman gland duct probing, something I think is uh, extremely valuable in treating MGD patients. Uh, True Tear is a device that was on the market briefly. I've touched on serum tears. And still a lot of people believe that the so-called magical factors that are either in serum or in homogenates that come from the amniotic membrane are really useful. There's even been published studies looking at finger prick blood as a therapy where patients literally touch their eye with their finger. Uh, perhaps not quite the sterility that I would like to see, but uh, an interesting approach. The rest of my remarks are going to touch on these six areas in active research for dry eye. Uh, I'm not going to speak about things that are very, very early in their development. I'm going to try to speak only about molecules for which there's early positive data and reason for optimism. So first I wanna to touch on the idea of intranasal tear stimulation. A lot of this goes back to our basic science. We know stimulation of the trigeminal nerve increases tear production. And we know that the fifth cranial nerve is accessible through the nose. In fact, years ago in the very early stages of the Restasis study, we needed to show that it was possible to stimulate more tears 
we took a six inch cotton swab and had to put it up our own noses. And if you mash a six inch cotton swab way up your nose, I promise you, you'll start tearing. Uh, that led to the True Tear device sold by Allergan, a device that uses electrical intranasal stimulation to boost tear production. And while not terribly popular, that's still uh, on sale today. A Varenicline called OCO1 is being developed by Oyster Point. Uh, this is a cholinergic receptor agonist. And it's the same chemical sold as an oral agent, oral formulation to help people stop smoking. Made as a nasal spray, there's been studies of over a thousand patients so far, and we see improvement in tear production, here marked rise in the Shermer's test, and also improved patient symptoms, here shown as eye dryness score with improvement of about 20%. Uh, this is a large body of data. It's already been submitted to the FDA for approval, and there's optimism that we'll get a judgment from the FDA by October of this year. Next are medications intended to reduce tear evaporation. Perfluorohexyloctanes, a long word, are a broad family of compounds that are complex. They have lipophilic and lipophobic ends, and depending on how they're specifically designed, can have very long retention times on the eye surface, excellent spreadability, and these are being developed by Novalik in Germany, and it's been licensed to Bausch & Lohm for development in the United States. Novatiers, also sold as Evotiers, are actually on, available for sale now in some countries, Germany, Australia, and I think several others, but because these don't match the monograph as an artificial lubricant in the United States, they're being developed as a pharmaceutical. One particular member of this family called Novo3 uh, is especially suited for treating evaporative dry eye as it was chosen for its very long surface retention time. Here you see data from the first phase three study that show rapid and sustained improvement in corneal staining on your right, and also marked improvement in a range of symptoms shown on the left. The second phase three study is in progress now, but we're actually very optimistic that this compound will be extremely well suited for patients who can no longer get functional lipids from their occluded glands. In the earlier talk, I did mention lacrotin, the glycoprotein produced by the lacrimal gland that helps restore neural health, boosts tear production, and boosts epithelial healing. Lacropep, being developed by Tear Solutions, is a synthetic fragment of only one end of the lacrotin molecule, we believe to be the most active. One phase two study has already been completed, and they've shown improvement in both symptoms and corneal staining. And interestingly, it seems to work very best in the most severe patients. More studies are certainly coming for this molecule. This is one I would be paying attention to. We spoke earlier about corneal pain receptors and neuropathic pain. So this next category includes agents that are designed to modulate neural transmission and treat neuropathy. Tibaniseran is in a drug class new to ophthalmology called small interfering RNA inhibitors. These drugs block protein synthesis by interfering with the RNA that codes for protein production. Phase two studies in dry eye have already shown moderate benefit in symptoms shown on your left and corneal fluorescein staining shown on your right but it's still pretty early in the development of this kind of compound. Again, a completely different approach for how we might treat ocular surface disease. Nerve growth factor has many effects on nerves, but doesn't act through the TPR pain receptors that we've mentioned. Instead, that works through the TRKA receptors on nerve terminals to exert its actions. We know nerve growth factor has many roles in ocular surface health and we can group them into categories. It increases tear secretion, it stimulates epithelial proliferation and differentiation, as well as its perhaps primary role in trophic effects in maintaining proper nerve function. Oxervate is a synthetic form of nerve growth factor and is approved in the United States for treatment of neurotrophic keratitis. The results are excellent, which is really important for this very severe disease with 65 to 75% of patients healing over a six week treatment course 
And this is patients with stage two or stage three neurotrophic keratitis. If you manage these patients, you know how impressive results like this are. Even more impressive is that 80% of these healed patients stay healed for an entire year. I'm mentioning it here because studies are ongoing looking at Oxervate as a treatment for dry eye. Based on all of uh, the, the effects that I've mentioned, including particularly epithelial growth. The fifth category of new drugs includes newer calcineurin inhibitors. That's drugs that are similar to Resasis or Sequa, or you've got Icurvus available to you. I mentioned earlier perfluorohexyl octanes, and Novalik has chosen one that's a little different to combine with cyclosporin. This one is called F4H5. And this one enhances the solubility and bioavailability of cyclosporin. It's not chosen simply to stop evaporation, more focused on the solubility. These data come from their first phase three study that shows strong improvement in symptoms and in corneal staining, and both of those as soon as four weeks after treatment. Uh, the second large phase three study is in progress in the United States now. The fifth category includes newer immunomodulatory drugs, and that's a broad category. So that includes uh, integrin blockers directed at interfering with T-cell binding and homing, and compounds that may exert actions against TNF-alpha. Uh, it's very early in this research, and unfortunately, because I'm involved in these studies, uh, confidentiality agreements prevent me from saying much more other than to tell you they're underway and just be aware that these are categories of treatments uh, that are certainly being pursued. The final category I'm gonna mention includes devices that are placed within the canaliculus, uh, which are designed as a drug in a polymer matrix that slowly dissolves and releases the drug into the tear film. Ocular Therapeutics is a company taking the lead on this approach and has implants that include cyclosporin, also dexamethasone, and both of these are in phase two studies now. Uh, the plug actually uh, shrinks in, in length, but increases in width, so provides both punctal occlusion as well as drug delivery in its treatment. So I've covered a lot of ground in terms of what we're looking at in advances of dry eye and what we can look forward to, including approaches that stimulate more tears, prevent evaporation, reduce inflammation, and even modulate pain. I know that's a lot of information in a very short time, but I hope I've given you some convincing information to generate optimism that our ability to treat dry eye keeps getting better and keeps making major steps forward. And I thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Dr. Tober. Uh, it was really a fantastic talk covering so many new things that are coming up because we keep having so many issues related to neuropathic pain, and the concept of use of this intracanalicular device in dry eye is something very good because uh, uh, not only it will you know, preserve some uh, tear uh, in the calde sac, but it also will you know, release some medicines, something like cyclosporin release or things like that. So it was a wonderful coverage and uh, we would like to have the opinion of our panelists on this. Joseph, uh, I think you mentioned about intra canalicular probing. I think it was first started by Steve Meskin in, from Tampa, Florida. And uh, initially he said he had encouraging results, but we didn't get any follow-up on that. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I probably get more phone calls asking me to publish my experience than about anything else. Dr. Meskin's published studies are small, 25 to 50 patients. Uh, I started doing this treatment in 2009 based on his ARVO paper that said 100% of his patients had relief of symptoms, which I frankly uh, was skeptical about, but I thought, well, I, I really have to try it. In the beginning, I had no idea how to anesthetize the lid adequately. I just used preparicane and it was terrible. I did six patients the first day. Uh, the patients started sweating, two had a vasovagal episode. I think I had a vasovagal episode. So I called them the next day and I said, I'm quite sure that I hurt you, but did I help you? And their answer was, are you kidding? I could see better on the way home. That was fantastic. Okay, so we spent a lot of time escalating the level of anesthetic we use. And now it's kind of a gel that I apply for about 12 minutes. 10% of patients will take a Valium just to take away some anxiety before. 
it's not a pain-free procedure, but I'd say the discomfort is trivial. I think I've treated uh, 2,500 patients at this point. Uh, I think it's a fantastic procedure. I will say, and I have not summated this and published it, that I achieve 70% relief of symptoms in about 70% of patients. I think it's an extraordinary procedure and it taught me a lot. The first time I put a probe through some of these obstructions and you literally feel the firmness, the level of blockage, the idea that we're having patients do lit hygiene at home and pressing with a finger is ridiculous. These are blockages that will not be overcome by that. And I can't imagine you can control the disease in those patients unless you're doing this. It also made me think of MGD in a totally different way. So I think there are patients, and these are two camps, who have uh, retention of oil in their glands, in a sense, almost like a micro abscess. And if you don't let it out, you don't solve the problem. That's different from patients who are lipid deficient in their tear film, whose discomfort comes from a different basis. And, and I'm sure there's overlap. Uh, I don't have a great way to separate those, but I think of them as totally different. So probing works if you have obstruction, and again, we go back to the finger. You have to press firmly enough to define if there's obstruction or not. I do not rely on my biometry, my biography to make that judgment. I rely on my finger much more. So are you still using that uh, Meskin's formula of 100 micron probe? Because my apprehensions there are that uh, the mammalian glands go straight for about a millimeter, millimeter, millimeter and a half. Beyond that, they get tortuous, especially with the advanced MGD. Their tract is never straight. So one apprehension that has been very frequently uh, raised at many forums is that you might be actually causing a perforation within the mammalian gland lumen. Uh, and how, how, what's your take on that? Yeah, absolutely. So there are three, well, there, there are three probes that are marketed, a two millimeter length, four and six. I've never used a six. The six is, it's like trying to push a piece of spaghetti. If, if you, it's very thin, when it's that long, it's very flexible and very hard to use. In fact, patients with very hard obstructions, I usually take the two millimeter, cut it in half so I use a one and make a tiny perforation in the openings and then I come back and do a two. Maybe 15% of patients, I'll do a four millimeter. Um, again, my experience is considerable with this and I'll tell you, I don't believe I have ever perforated a single gland. The best analogy I can offer you is if you put your arm in a sleeve of your shirt, have you ever gone through the fabric as opposed to going all the way to the bottom? I don't think it happens. I think you would feel it. There's, there's a very clear sensation of where you are and what you're doing. Now you will get some feedback of a little bit of blood if what you're going through is a vascularized membrane uh, inside the gland, no question. But at least as many times you get a real outpouring of oil coming out of the gland. And it, it's extremely satisfying and informative. There's no question in my mind, this is an important procedure with a difficult learning curve that's really worth doing. And having said that, there's only one manufacturer of the probes, at least to the best of my knowledge. Uh, I've made three different tries to design a non-disposable and have failed. So the design of what they have is really quite good. Thank you. A lot of patients have uh, this neuropathic pain. You keep doing everything, but they don't, uh, you know, get relief. So uh, what do you suggest, like, uh, you know, in these patients, what should we do? Uh, my most effective method is to refer them to someone else, but th that's perhaps not what everyone <laughs> wants to do. Um, if you accept that this is a problem of central processing of pain, kind of the easiest thing to introduce to patients is uh, drugs like gabapentin, uh, which you can easily portray as treating neurogenic neuropathic discomfort. Low dose antidepressants have also been very effective. At least two different centers in the US are looking at uh, TENS units, low dose uh, electrical treatments, in some cases transcranial. So little pads are put on both sides of the head and you don't electrocute your patient, but you do something to change the way nerves are processing. Uh, we're not 100% successful. Telling patients, explaining to them, there's a point when, when you've received so much pain messaging, even though the pain is gone, your brain is still giving you the message. That's what we have to turn off. You have to get the patient to understand what you're doing. 
So communicating what this means in words a patient can understand is really important. Uh, for me, gabapentin and amitriptyline have been quite effective. Uh, as far as topical treatments, serum tears and amniotic membrane, again, releasing those magical factors that perhaps change how nerves are functioning, that seems to be all we have. And by the way, there is evidence that patients with neuropathic pain, the problem is peripheral as much as it's central. Uh, alterations in tear serotonin have been reported, and uh, we have a lot to learn. Um, confocal microscopy is fantastic. It's perhaps diagnostic, but it's certainly very unavailable because not even every confocal microscope can generate the kind of images uh, that you need, uh, and that's not very available for most patients. So we, we have a way to go. Joe, have you tried probing for patients with the MZD in SJS patients? Absolutely. There's, there's no type of dry eye patient that I wouldn't probe. Okay. It's really a matter of, is there obstruction within the glands? There uh, is for tremendous, me, I, yeah, tremendous uh, obstruction there, and I think that's the major problem. So I'm going to start using uh, this probing uh, technique. Part of the challenge is you don't know. You know, if you look at, and it works two ways. So I've done a lot of my biography, and what's very clear to me is the uh, absence of white stripes does not mean absent glands. I've had any number of patients who have tremendous dropout. Perhaps you see six remaining white stripes. And when I pick up a probe, I can still enter 25 glands. So my biography is not what they tell us it is. Perhaps we're not using the right wavelength of light. Uh, but I don't believe the, the lack of a white stripe means the gland is atrophic and gone. Mm -hmm. uh, I've tried to get companies to really do the studies on this, but as you might imagine, since they're very happy to sell the machines, the last thing they want to do is provide evidence that uh, it's not a good metric or it's not reliable. But I think we, there's a lot more to learn there. So for me, it's home hygiene first. Uh, pharmaceutical second, doxycycline, azithromycin, we could quibble about dosages. Uh, then I go to thermal pulsation, again, many different devices to do it. If the orifices are patent, if they're not patent, I don't think anything works except probing. Uh, Dr. Sober, uh, on a slightly different uh, tack, um, Osmoprotectants, uh, we talk about osmoprotectants in our, uh, in our lubricating drops. Um, and all the years prior to osmoprotectants, we were using drops without osmoprotections. And would that really make a, a huge difference or is it overrated? I think it's a bit overrated. It's certainly, we, we have um, a variety of tiers, I think mostly sold by Allergan that contain uh, osmoprotectants. Uh, I think they're good. I don't think they're game changers. I put a lot of um, hope into oil containing drops of which we also have very few. Um, and they're too not, not quite as wonderful as what I would like. I will say when there are patients who, uh, let's go to the end stage MGD patient, the patient who truly has no gland left and probing or no probe, there's no oil to come out. Well, you've got two choices. Uh, you can replace the oil, and that's not very available, or you can get a compound that acts like oil. And that's exactly where that Novo 3 in development lands. And I don't know if it's available in India. I've certainly had my patients go to pharmacies in Australia and order uh, successfully either Nova Tears or Evo Tears. Uh, and I would encourage you to explore that. It's really interesting. The drop that comes out of the bottle is perhaps half the volume of what you're used to in a normal eye drop. You just, you don't need it very much. Even that may be relevant because a, a, a drop uh, dropped onto the eye stimulates a blink reflex, which very quickly disseminates the drug and perhaps, or the, the agent, uh, the active moiety, and perhaps loses the agent. A drop this small does not stimulate that kind of reaction and may have something to do with a longer retention time. But the longer retention time, if you recall my earlier slide, uh, is, is many, many, many fold higher than what you see with a traditional drop. So if I knew that I had a chemical that was the anti-evaporation shield, perhaps saying it that way makes sense for why that may be an approach of choice 
in patients who are really end stage and cannot generate their own oils. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Tober. It was a wonderful discussion, and we had a, a very nice uh, discussion in this webinar. Three wonderful talks and very nice panel discussion. Uh, uh, Tatyal, sir, would you like to say something in the end? Uh, uh, Rajesh, we had, a, as you rightly said, uh, one of the best uh, presentations possible on a dry and ocular surface. And the, the leaders in this field were there. And I think people would be very fortunate to listen to their talks uh, subsequently also. And uh, please, if you have some questions coming up, you can forward to them and they can send the answer to uh, people also. But the ultimate thing which uh, it came out is, you know, you do have uh, a very nice treatment uh, possible for all types of dry eye and ocular surface disorders. And correct diagnosis and management will really benefit the people uh, who are chronically suffering with these diseases. And they go from one door to other door looking for a better options. So I think this is uh, what I think needs to be presented to our people uh, regularly. Once in a three months so that everybody has a clear idea what is to be done with uh, these dry eye and ocular surface uh, disease patients. Wonderful presentation. Uh, we are really thankful to all the presenters. So uh, in the end, I would like to thank all the speakers, Dr. Joseph Topper, Dr. Virinda Sangwan, and Dr. Rohit Shetty. Three wonderful talks and uh, uh, wonderful panelists, Dr. Rajiv Mukherjee, Dr. Rishi Mohan, and our president, Professor Tetyal, and Dr. Namrata Sharma. So I would like to thank one and all. I would like to thank CIPLA for uh, uh, organizing this event. And uh, I would like to thank the audiovisual team. And of course, a special thanks to Dr. Rohit Shetty, who is traveling, but he has managed to send his presentation and has also participated in the, in the uh, panel discussion. So a big thanks to you. And thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks.